Let's get this right. Thanks very much for the, uh, the introduction and uh, for having me here today. And thanks to Scott um, for the, uh, the spiel just then, which is a fantastic lead into our next topic, uh, which is native title. Can everyone hear me okay? I know the sound's been a little bit quiet. Okay, brilliant. Um, I wanted to start the presentation with a, just a look at a couple of maps, um, because I think it's always always useful to put these things in a, in a geospatial context. Um, unfortunately, the colouring of that map is not very useful. But, but let's imagine that, that WA is in there somewhere, um, concentrated in the southwest, um, existing, existing projects, and we can see pretty clearly, or at least we could see, if we could see the outline of WA, um, both the, the sparsity of projects in the rangelands at present, that land mass that makes up 87% of, of the state, um, and the huge potential, I think, that, that is there. I mean, if you could look at the density in the southwest, um, and if you were to multiply that across the rangelands, you can start to get a sense of um, what, this, what this industry could be. Obviously, the purpose of today is to, using that as a starting point, say, well, why doesn't it look like that. Why doesn't the rest of the state look like the southwest or western Australia? And what do we need to do to bring about that change? Um, and having an understanding of native title, having an understanding of how that drives the process, how native title holders participate in the process, um, is, I think, a critical part of, of unlocking this potential. So I'll try and touch on that in the, uh, in the next 20 minutes. One other plan, which shows up a little bit better than the last one, um, the current state of play of native title across the, the country. And you can see, looking at WA, there's a very strong correlation between native title determinations and native title claims um, and that unlocked area that I was talking about. In the southwest, you can see that there's a bit of a note there, effectively um, recognising that the southwest Noongar settlement is, has or will, assuming it all goes through, um, will deal with native title issues in the southwest and establish a framework for that. In the rest of Western Australia, you can see in the central desert and a lot of the Kimberley region, you've got this darker green exclusive possession native title, and I'll talk about the significance of that shortly, but you would have noticed in Scott's presentation, he referred to the CFI Act and um, the recognition that that gives to exclusive possession native title and the rights that that come with that and, and put those native title holders um, in a particular position, or make, make them particularly well placed to take advantage of, of carbon farming projects. Um, in other regions of WA, the, the lighter green is non-exclusive native title, so generally that's where there's coexistence with pastoral leases. Um, the blue, the light blue regions are claims that are underway but will be determined in, in due course. I'm sure those familiar with the native title process will understand that it is a very slow one. Um, claims take five, ten years to be determined. Um, and also noteworthy in the WA context is the, the yellowish portion across the gold fields. Um, that is not to say that there is not potentially native title in that area. Um, that's a reflection of what was the subject of the Wongatha claim, uh, which was dismissed by the federal court in 2007. Um, in due course, there will be new claims over that area. That's something that is being worked on by the native title representative bodies. So, so don't think that, that native title is... Uh, that there won't be native title in that area, but it will, the claims will come on stream in the next few years. There's really two dimensions to talking about native title in this context, um, and it depends on which particular hat you're wearing. Are you looking at developing a project as a third-party proponent, in which case um, you'll be looking to interface with native title holders for the purposes of obtaining their consent and talking about their participation in the project. Um, but equally, as I mentioned before, particularly with exclusive possession native title, those native title holders are in a, in a pretty unique position um, to develop their own project. So when we're talking about the native title implications um, of carbon farming, it's useful to, to approach it really looking at those two dimensions. On the one hand, um, are we talking about a third party proponent interfacing with native title holders for the purpose of obtaining their consent? Or are we talking about a native title holder driven project? And the, the legal issues um, are quite distinct. Basic project development requirements, doesn't matter whether you're talking about carbon farming, mining infrastructure, whatever it is, 
in order to develop a project, two main components, land access or land tenure and statutory approvals. Um, sounds simple, but a lot of people, it's quite common um, for people to overlook the significance of the land access issues. The, uh, a common trap we often see is people think because I have a permit to clear vegetation, um, to set bushfires, whatever it is, that that therefore gives me the right to go on the land and, and do that. Now, land managers in the room will certainly understand that that's not the case. You need both components. Um, I, I won't be dealing with statutory approvals, but native title certainly factors very heavily in the, the land access side of the uh, equation. So how does it factor in? Um, and what we're talking about here is, is new grants of tenure. So any time you are proposing to be granted new tenure or new rights over Crown land in which native title may persist, um, the Native Title Act requires you to go through the future act processes of, of the act. And those processes basically have a... There's a number of different categories, and depending on the rights you are proposed to be granted in Crown land... Um, you will either need to, or the state will need to, give notice to the native title holders. Um, in certain circumstances, seek their comment. In other circumstances, they'll have a right to object. Or at the very upper end of the scale, they'll have a right to negotiate, which is typically what applies for, for mining projects. In the, in the carbon farming context, if you think about the different tenure options <coughs> excuse me, that you could potentially use to advance a, a project like this, um, a licence, for example, uh, that could be granted over Crown land that might give you sufficient rights to advance a project would probably have to go through the low impact framework of the Native Title Act. Um, there is an issue, or at the very least it would have to go through that framework. There is an issue with that framework in that low impact, what the Native Title Act calls low impact grants, can't endure beyond a Native Title determination being made. Um, there, is an, there is an assumption that when a native title determination is made, effectively the issue will need to be revisited. So to the extent that low impact process could be applied to the grant of tenure for carbon farming projects in the rangelands, the limitations on that low impact process probably rule that one out. And that's particularly with regard to the permanence type issues that Scott was talking about. Um, grants to third parties over pastoral leases, um, so not so much diversification permits, but other grants, um, are limited, the native title processes are limited to the taking of timber, sand and gravel, construction type materials. So again, that process is not available to us for the purposes of advancing carbon farming projects in the rangelands. Equally, the processes that are available for the grant of mining tenure rely on something in the Native Title Act called the freehold test, which basically asks the question, could you grant this particular type of tenure over freehold land? If you could, if the answer is yes, then the right to negotiate will apply. The difficulty in this situation is we're talking about the rangelands, we're talking about crown land, because any tenure that could be granted over crown land is going to be specific to crown land, it's going to rely on crown land powers, the answer to the freehold test in that context is no. Can you grant this tenure over freehold land? No, you can't. So if anyone was to ask the question, well, why can't tenure for carbon farming projects be granted in the same way as mining tenure? The answer, at least from the perspective of the Native Title Act, is because it doesn't apply to Crown land in the same way as it does freehold land. And that's why we rule out that option. So we've got a dozen or so different options Three of the major ones that we could have used are ruled out. There's then a, a default position, which really leaves you with the binary choice of either compulsorily acquiring native title in that land to grant the tenure, or a voluntary indigenous land use agreement. And my understanding is that policy across the board has always been, and although it may not be expressed has always been that land won't be, there won't be a compulsory acquisition of native title for the purposes of facilitating the grant of tenure, um, certainly for, for carbon farming projects. And that's a principle that is reflected in, I think, the rangelands reform, which I'll come to shortly, which contemplates that if rangelands leases are to be granted, they must be granted pursuant to an Indigenous land use agreement. And I'll explain 
the, uh, the implications of that shortly. Scott's touched on the treatment of native title under the CFI Act, so I won't spend too much time on that. But there is a recognition, the Act goes to some lengths to recognise the particular role of native title holders and registered native title body corporates, which are the entities that are set up to administer native title. Um, it recognises their particular role in the process, particularly in the context of exclusive possession native title. And what I would say there is what the Act is doing is where the federal court has said these native title holders hold this land, they have rights of exclusive possession as against the whole world, the CFI Act recognises that that includes carbon sequestration rights um, and it recognises that they have an eligible interest, what the Act calls an eligible interest. Um, now, it, on exclusive possession native title land, it actually deems them to be project proponents um, and puts them in that position by default. Now, they can effectively contract out of that, but that's the default position. For non-exclusive uh, non -exclusive native title land, um, there's effectively a requirement for consent, but not that automatic deeming, not that project proponency. It's a slightly different version of the, the plan we looked at before, just trying to tease out the distinction between exclusive possession native title and non-exclusive possession native title. So you can see again those dark green areas, they are areas that are otherwise unallocated crown land, um, areas where exclusive possession native title has been found to exist. You can see pretty particularly the, the central desert there and the carve-outs, the white carve-outs from those dark green areas are national parks for the most part. Um, the light green non-exclusive possession native title that's been recognised in the Pilbara um, down Esperance Way and obviously through, uh, through the Kimberley and the expectation would be that as more of the claims are substantiated that that will, the balance of the map will be, will be filled in for the most part with, with that light green, certainly in those pastoral areas. When we're dealing with the issue of land grants um, and the processes I was talking about before, that's really looking at it from the third party perspective. I'm a third party, what are the native title processes I need to go through to get tenure granted um, for the purpose of facilitating a carbon project. But as I mentioned before, it's important to have regard to the role or the potential for native title groups and native title holders to drive these projects in their own right. Um, exclusive possession native title does give them exclusive possession as against the whole world. And a number of determinations that are being made include an express right to take from that land for any purpose, including commercial purposes. Now this is is quite new. Um, there's only been a couple of determinations in WA that are recognising this, but that is certainly a basis on which some groups will say our native title not only allows us to possess this land, but it very clearly allows us to, to use the resources um, for commercial purposes. But in, in other determinations, the right to use the resources is limited to personal, domestic and communal use. That probably limits the ability of those native title holders to rely on their native title for the purposes of developing the project. And those are the circumstances in which the state has approached groups and said, well, if you want to, yes, the CFI Act will deem you to be a project proponent. Um, yes, you have a status under that Act and some of your rights are recognised under that Act. But the state has proposed, uh, in some circumstances controversially, that there needs to be an additional grant of tenure from the state to facilitate the project. There needs to be a licence or something similar. And I know that that's a bone of contention in, in the Kimberley, for example. And that discussion about these commercial rights, what is the ambit of them, that's a discussion that will be, be ongoing. I wanted to touch on the role of the rangelands reforms very briefly. As Scott mentioned, um, one of the impetuses for the rangelands reform is the idea that a rangelands lease may well be a much better vehicle for progressing these developments given the limitations or perceived limitations at least around pastoral leases. Scott mentioned before that 
a rangeland's lease can be for any purpose, principally consistent with the preservation of the rangelands as a natural resource. What does that mean for the native title process? Well, that will be a future act. And it will be a future act that doesn't fit un under any of those categories we spoke about before. So we're in a situation where, in order to have that tenure granted, you'll have to negotiate an Indigenous land use agreement with the native title holders or the native title claimants. The content of, of that agreement um, is at large. There are certain requirements that have to be fulfilled, but ultimately it's for the parties to determine. It costs money. The negotiation process has costs, both in, in time um, and in, in, in cash terms. The state said that it is unlikely to provide financial support, but it will provide negotiation guidelines and a template Indigenous land use agreement, which will hopefully frame those discussions. Um, I wanted to conclude just by making or reiterating a point that was made by the state in the course of the rangelands reforms. And you can see the quote there that one key element identified by the rangelands development expert advisory group was the need to better engage with native title holders and claimants who must be a partner in any new activities in the rangelands for them to succeed. The, whether you're a third party proponent trying to seek the consent of native title holders or you're a native title group looking for support to develop your own carbon farming projects, the concept of partnership is going to be critical to the success of these projects. Most of them, particularly if there's new tenure, will need to be facilitated by Indigenous land use agreements. The first parties tr seeking to negotiate those will find it challenging. Um, but, so as Scott mentioned before, there's one of these first mover costs involved. But I think, and I certainly hope, that once people become more accustomed to the process, a set of market practices develops around the substance of those agreements and they're better understood, that those agreements will start to flow quite quickly, um, that the tenure will be able to be granted and will be able to, to unlock the potential of those rangelands. So all I would say to people to bear in mind is, is that native title is going to be critical to the success of these projects, it's certainly critical to the grant of new tenure, and it really needs to be approached in that spirit of partnership, focusing on communicating with the native title groups, taking with it a, a, an attitude of collaboration and ultimately in the knowledge that you need to procure the consent for the project to advance. Thank you. <laughs>